Friends, let's talk about Blaise Pascal today. Blaise Pascal, like René Descartes, was a Frenchman. Okay, he lived sometime after Descartes, 1623 to 1662 are his dates. Okay, he was a polymath, did a bunch of different things in life. Um, primarily, he was well known as a mathematician did work on conic sections, uh, parabolas, ellipses, hyperbolas, circles, those sorts of things, uh, and understood uh, at a much deeper level than anybody else what some of their um, geometrical features were. What else did he do? Um, he designed the world's first calculating machine, so that was a predecessor of our modern computers, and actually a computing language is named after him as a result. Uh, he was involved in a variety of theological and philosophical disputes. Uh, he had practical engineering interests. He designed the first subway system in the world uh, underneath Paris. The idea of trains going from this place to that place underground was his conception. Okay, unfortunately, he died very young, died at the age of 38 of what was then called consumption. We now call it tuberculosis. Okay, and uh, actually did not finish the work that we have read for today, the pensées. That translated means thoughts, okay, it's French for thoughts. He didn't ever finish it. So it's an unfinished work, and it's just a series of vignettes. And by vignettes, I mean short little paragraphs or snippets of paragraphs, even, that articulate a certain philosophical thought, but they just leave it at that in kind of an unfinished state. And then that do not go on to piece it all together systematically. Okay, if you remember Descartes, when we were reading Descartes' meditations, it's all very carefully constructed, meticulously built, the system where he talks about uh, the various objections that can be made against his views and uh, the reasons why he holds his views and so forth. Okay, that's not the way the Pensees is constructed at all. The Pensees is a series of just little snippet observations about life and about philosophy, about the human experience. Okay, this is partly by design. Okay, and so this is probably the first point that I should make about Blaise Pascal in addition to these background points. This is partly by design in addition to the fact that he died young and wasn't able to finish the work. It is by design because Pascal was a fideist. Fideism is the view that reason is bankrupt as a way of identifying solutions to life's problems and to the human condition. Fideism. Okay, um, if you have sat in this class and you have heard me lecture and talk about various different philosophers in history, and this guy believed that thing, and that guy believed this thing, and sometimes they contradict each other, sometimes they don't agree, you know, there are good arguments for God's existence, good arguments against God's existence. Uh, and if you have thrown up your hands at the end of these class sessions and you thought to yourself, well, if you can come to contradictory conclusions through the use of your reason, what use is reason at all? Okay, if that has been your thought, then Pascal is your guy because he's like the anti-reason philosopher. Okay, he is the anti-reason thinker who thinks that reason is not able to obtain all the things that previous philosophers like Descartes and so forth thought that it could obtain. Okay, reason cannot lead us to truth, in other words. Reason is limited. Famously, Pascal said, the heart has its reasons that reason does not know. Okay, signifying his belief that there are other ways that humans can learn and know things that go beyond the use of our rational cognition. A couple other things uh, biographically about Pascal. He had a sister, Jacquie. Jacquie was also highly educated, and we think many of the thoughts of the Pensees come from Jacquie. Unfortunately, Jacquie lived at a time when women did not publish, and so uh, we do not have any work from Jacquie, okay? But we believe that she was actually a very important influence upon the ideas that are present in the Pensees. Uh, a couple other things about him. He was a very melancholy person, had a very uh, melancholy temperament. So, for instance, he once described human life this way. Okay, he said, um, the human experience is like sitting in a room. And in this room, there are no door, I'm sorry, no windows and one door. 
And we're all sitting on benches. All of the humans are all sitting on benches along the four walls of the room. And we wait. And every once in a while, a big man in a black executioner's hood with a giant axe comes through the door. And he hauls one of us away. And then shuts the door behind him. And the rest of us wait. And we know that our turn will come. And we too one day will be hauled through that door. And everyone else will see us go. And we don't know when our turn will come or when we will be executed. All we know is that it will happen. And that is the human condition, Pascal says, right? We don't know what's on the other side of that door, but uh, we wait for what that is going to be. Okay, it's kind of a melancholy perspective on the human condition, um, but a very famous one. Um, Pascal also... Uh, sometimes had um, more positive thoughts. So for instance, uh, he once said uh, in the Pensees, he said, look, if you look at human beings and compare them to the things around us, physically, we are very insignificant. Okay, if you look at us and compare us to enormous, the enormous features of the natural world that we see around us, the mountains, the rivers, the valleys, the forests, if you look beyond the earth, the sun, the planets, the stars, the galaxies, we are insignificant. Physically, we are insignificant. And, and these things are far more lasting than us. They were there before we are, and before we were, and they will be there after we are gone. So not only are we far weaker than they are, yet we are also, we are also far less um, far, far, uh, far smaller in temporal terms as well. Okay, but Pascal said, even in spite of all these things, still, we are significant. The reason why we are significant is because we know that these things exist, and they do not know that they exist. We know that the mountains and the rivers and the valleys and the sun and the planets and the stars exist, and they don't know they're there because we have conscious capacities and that consciousness, Pascal said, separates us in kind from these other things, makes us special, demarcates us as things of significance, creatures of significance, and creatures worthy of God's attention. Okay, so he had some moments when he was uh, more positive as well. Okay, he lived a very sickly life, died at age 38 of tuberculosis, and we only have a very few of his works. But they were very influential works especially because Pascal is one of the first breaths of postmodernism that you can find in the canon. Postmodernism is the idea that, um, that reason cannot lead us to truth, okay? That reason can just lead us to different perspectives, but not to one particular truth, which is true as such, capital T, truth. And Pascal is one of the first thinkers to introduce those kinds of ideas into the canon. And for that reason, he is justly famous. Let me pause and ask if there are questions or comments about any of these background ideas. Yes, sir. What is fideism? Fideism is the belief that reason cannot uh, lead us to truth. It is um, the idea that reason is bankrupt as a method of inquiry. Reason cannot uh, sh uh, guide us to the truth. Um, so, for instance, uh, a great believer in reason, Thomas Aquinas, believed that you can use arguments to prove that God exists. Like a cosmological argument, for instance, okay? Um, Pascal would say you cannot use arguments to prove such a thing. Because reason cannot guide us to truth. Reason is bankrupt as a way of identifying that. Okay. Other questions? Has anybody ever been to France? For about 10 minutes? Passing through the airport. Um, I have been to Paris uh, for about 10 days some years ago. It was a lot of fun. I hope to travel again at some point. Um, my wife and I have not traveled since we've had little kids. Uh, it kind of shuts down your travel for a few years. And then there's the pandemic, of course, too. But maybe at some point in the future, I can go back. And uh, Paris was really, really nice. Ex 
That is the stereotype, and some Parisians did not. Uh, they don't like it when you speak French to them. So, you know, here I am, English speaker, and I try to, like, muddle along in my French, and they immediately switch into English. They just don't like talking to you in French. <laughs> uh, my French is really, really bad, too, so there's that to, to contend with. I'm sure they could tell right away that I was a poser. Okay, um, let me talk a little bit now about the most famous contribution that Pascal made, or at least what we'll talk about in this class. Okay, and that is the wager. Pascal made really big contributions to probability theory and to gambling theory and to wagers, all based on mathematics. And he decided, well, look, let's apply these concepts to philosophy and talk about the wager of life. Okay, so actually, officially, this should be the wager of life. All human beings everywhere have to make the wager of life. You cannot get out of it. You cannot escape the wager. What is the wager? Well, you must choose. You must wager. And you must wager in response to this question. Does God exist? Because quite clearly, if God exists, that has very important implications for how we ought to live our lives. And if God does not exist, that has implications as well for how we ought to live our lives. And all humans have to make this wager. You cannot get out of it. If you are agnostic and say, well, we don't know, that's the agnostic position, the position that uh, we don't know one way or another whether God exists. If you are agnostic, your view becomes a no upon your deathbed, Pascal would say. Okay? Because you are wagering, practically speaking, no throughout the course of your life. Does God exist? Well, there are several different scenarios here that we can look at as we think about this wager. And let's actually illustrate them in the form of a matrix. You can wager yes, or you can wager no. And the outcome could be yes, in other words, you die and you wake up on the other side, yes. Or the outcome could be no, God does not exist. Okay, so there are four options, according to Pascal. You can wager yes, and it could be either yes or no, or you can wager no, and it could be either yes or no. Let's assume you wager yes, and we'll start out here, and we'll talk about this first quadrant in the matrix. You wager yes, and the answer is yes. And remember, Pascal is operating from the Christian tradition. So suppose you wager yes, God does exist. You live your life in accordance with that wager. You know, you uh, attend church regularly, and he's Catholic, attend mass regularly. You give to the impoverished. You uh, do good deeds uh, to all. You treat all fairly and honestly. Uh, you live in, in accordance with the principles of good Christian living. Okay, and you die and you wake up on the other side and yes, God does exist. What do you get? You get to go to heaven, right? You get eternal life. Pascal's a mathematician. Let's quantify that mathematically. Plus infinity. <laughs> okay? It's like you win. It's like you won the wager if that happens. Okay, um, what do you lose? Do you lose anything? Yeah, you lose on the things that you could have done, right? All the, um, the taxes you could have cheated on, right? The uh, little ladies you could have abused and exploited and, you know, the slum dwellings that you run as a landlord, right? Those kinds of things, okay? Um, could have slept around a lot more, right? Um, we'll say minus 100. We'll assign that a mathematical value as well. <laughs> but notice that those are all finite losses. In comparison to the infinite gain, it's obviously like of no consequence. Okay? All right. Now, suppose you wager yes, and the answer is no. Okay. So you die, and uh, Pascal thought if the answer is no, then you're never going to find out, actually, because you're just going to probably, uh, probably, he thought the other alternative is um, 
that uh, there's just no waking up on the other side. Just dying is the end. Like, that's, that's just it, right? So you actually never find out. Okay, but suppose you wager yes and the answer is no. You lose all of the things you could have done, right? Every sin is sweet for a season, sweet for a period of time before the consequences set in. Okay, you lose all those sweet sins that you could have done for a short period of time before the consequences. Do you get anything? Well, I mean, yeah. You get some things, right? We'll assign it a numerical value that's less than the uh, minus 100 so that it can signify you losing the wager. For instance, I personally am a happily married man, faithful to my wife. Um, I find this to be a very attractive lifestyle. Okay, And I think I'm actually happier than I would otherwise be if I were a swinger. Okay, Or pursuing some sort of uh, a looser lifestyle. So some would argue, a lot of philosophers in the tradition have argued that virtue is its own reward, right? And actually, Aristotle, for instance, said a life of virtue is actually more enjoyable than a life of vice. If it is more enjoyable, then we should assign it a value greater than the minus 100 on an absolute basis. But for the sake of illustrating the loss of the wager, I'm going to assign it a value less than the minus 100, suggesting that a life of vice is more fun than a life of virtue, okay? <laughs> for what it's worth. Okay, um, <laughs> this is kind of fun. Suppose you say no, you wager no, and the answer is no. <laughs> okay, so we're now here in this quadrant. Suppose you say no, and the answer is no. You've won the wager, right? You won. What do you get? Oh, yeah, you get lots of things, right? Right? You get all the uh, enjoyable sins that you, you know, always wanted to do and weren't ever able to do, and now you can do them because, you know, God's not going to punish you for them, right? <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's probably not a really good exercise to think about all the things that you could do if, uh, like, if you weren't, well, weren't, weren't committed to your Christian moral principles. Okay. All right, so no, and the answer is no, um, what do you lose? Well, probably the virtue and the reward of the virtue that you could have had had you led a virtuous life, okay? Again, I'll assign it a numerical value less on an absolute basis than the plus 100 to illustrate that you have won the wager, okay? So you, you get something. All right, suppose you wager no, and you wake up on the other side, and the answer is yes. It's like, no, I'm hosed. <laughs> okay, so we'll assign it a numerical value and say minus infinity. <laughs> okay. All right, and obviously, um, yeah, oh, I'm sorry, I mixed this up. So minus infinity up here, and obviously you do get plus 100 because you got to enjoy um, all the things that you always wanted to do for at least a short period of time before you die. Okay. Okay. Um, so what should you wager? Should you wager yes or should you wager no? Pretty clearly on this rendering of things, you should wager yes. Can someone articulate for us why Pascal thinks you should wager yes? Yeah. Yeah, it's like infinite upside. Yeah. If you wager yes, you are opening yourself to the possibility of an infinite upside, whereas if you wager no, you are risking the possibility of an infinite downside. Yeah, the worst that can happen is you cease to exist, and, you know, besides probably 500 years from now or 1,000 years from now, um, nobody will even remember that you existed, and the fact that you lived will be a completely insignificant thing. Yes, Charles. Good, good, good question, right? So Pascal said, if you don't believe in God, act as though you do. Go to Mass, say the prayers, give charitably, and over time you will find belief arising in you. Um, so 
For Pascal, belief is not something that, in fact, actually, I'm glad you raised that. This is an interesting topic. Uh, do you guys think you can control your beliefs? Can you control your beliefs? Okay, because there's actually a dispute among philosophers about whether this is possible. All right, so I'm shutting my eyes now, and I'm imagining myself in my living room at home. I believe it. It is the case. But quite clearly at the back of my mind, I realize this is not the case. And I know that I'm telling myself a lie in my mind when I do that. So that seems to be a belief I can't control, right? But like I tried by an act of will to believe it. Okay, so here's the question, right? Can we, by an act of will, can we tr trying, you know, suppose you don't believe in God, can you, by an act of will, can you try really hard and come to believe in God as a result of your act of will? So some philosophers would use examples like what I just gave and say, no, actually, we cannot, by an act of our will, trying really hard, believe anything. Beliefs are not under our control, they would say. What do you guys think of that? Okay. Right. Good. Yeah. So other philosophers argue, well, belief is not just a matter of intellectual assent. It's actually a more comprehensive kind of a concept. It involves, yes, an intellectual component, but also an activity component. Okay, I believe that my marriage is a very valuable thing. I believe that my marriage is a source of great stability and truth in my life. As part of that belief, I act on it. And I, you know, I am faithful to my wife as a result, right? That's a comprehensive kind of a concept, not just an intellectual sense sort of a thing. Okay, Pascal thought of belief in the more comprehensive terms. So he said, basically, if you go to Mass and you say the prayers and you read the scriptures and you give to the poor, this is evidence that you are actually articulating your belief. Right? And the intellectual assent, the feeling, as it were, of believing God exists is something that will follow. It will follow the action. Because he thought that feeling and emotion is something that just kind of trails actual truths. And so if you find yourself unable to believe in God, but you want to believe in God, act as though you do, and you will come to believe in God. By virtue of the fact that belief is a comprehensive kind of a concept. Does that help a little bit, Matthew, with what you were saying earlier? I don't think belief is actually something, in, in, in terms of an intellectual assent sort of a thing, something I can control in the moment. Okay, but I wonder if it's something that I can control over a long period of time through habit. I don't know. Yeah. Right, yeah. So, um... Yeah, for sure. Yeah, thoughts are weird things. Thoughts partially seem to be under our control, but hardly ever are thoughts like fully under our control. Okay, so for instance, um, I have this recurring dream that I have from time to time when I'm asleep. And that dream is that we've lost the house and that I and my family have woken up and we are now under a bridge on a street in Houston and it's raining. Okay, this is a completely irrational thought has no basis in reality. Like we are financially secure. I've worked really hard. My wife works really hard. We're not going to lose the house. We're not going to be on a street under a bridge anytime soon. It's a completely irrational thought. And yet I seem to be unable to control having this thought, you know, and waking up to this dream. And for a few minutes as the dream dissipates, you know, believing this to be the case, uh, as I'm still half asleep at night. Um, 
Some would argue that thoughts are not under our control. I guess the view there that uh, I've come to hold and that I found convincing in the philosophical tradition is that thoughts are kind of under our control. They're kind of under our control. Um, so, uh, so, so imagine an illustration, right? Um, you guys have all seen before somebody use a bullwhip, yes? Like flick a bullwhip and like the whip like uh, ripples and snaps at the end, yes? Everybody's seen this happen before or at least can visualize it happening? Okay, somebody who's flicking a bullwhip cannot control the precise location of the end of the whip. But someone who's flicking it can kind of generally control where it's going. And that's, I guess, the view of thoughts that I found to be most convincing, is that thoughts are generally under our control, but not precisely under our control. Okay, so generally speaking, what you put into your mind will be what you get out of it. Generally speaking, if you, um, you know, put constructive things or, or rigorous things into your mind, your mind will improve. Generally speaking, if you put junk into your minds, you know, the, the McDonald's of the soul type fare that in a lot of entertainment feeds for us, right? Uh, then your mind will, like, it'll deteriorate as a result, generally speaking, but not precisely. Because it's the sort of thing where it's, it's kind of a, a, a sort of a general kind of an influence. Is that, is that a hand? I said it. Cool, cool. All right. Um, so Pascal thinks you should take the wager. He thinks you should take the wager because you are opening yourself up to the possibility of infinite upside while um, if you were to say no and not take the wager, I mean not assent to the wager, you are risking the possibility of infinite downside. Let me throw this out there now and ask for objections to this very famous wager of life. I'm going to list three up here on the board, but I want to see if you guys have any objections that immediately come to mind as you look at this um, philosophical matrix. Objections to the wager. Yes. Say here. Right? Well, I assigned it a value less than the vicious life. Right. Oh, yeah. Well, um, so I actually personally believe, I, I agree with Aristotle, that virtue is its own reward. And uh, I think my life is better because I'm not a shoplifter. I think it's actually better because I don't cheat on my taxes and better because I'm faithful to my wife than it would otherwise go. Um, but, you know, I can see where a case could be made for saying, you know, if you didn't get caught for your shoplifting you could make your life better off by virtue of lifting clothes or whatever you wanted to shoplift. Like assuming that you never got caught. Yeah, and assuming also that you could dull your conscience. There's that as well. So, um, yeah, so if you, if you get plagued by your conscience for the next few years after your shoplifting spree, True, true, true that. Very, very good point. Yeah, so, um, so I mean, I guess it could be disputed whether uh, we should assign virtue a value less than vice, but if virtue were to be assigned a value greater than vice, then that would actually strengthen the case for saying yes to the wager. So there's that as well. Okay, yes. Good. Yeah. That's a great comment, man. I'm so glad you shared that. Um, that's a that's in fact the first objection is that the wager is cynical. Basically, Pascal seems to be saying you should believe in God because of what you can get out of it, <laughs> right? So, like, you want to get as much as possible. 
So you should believe in God. <laughs> um, but, you know, if you're a good Christian, right, you know that we're taught that self-interest is a dangerous kind of a perspective. And while we have to think about self to some extent, still, uh, we need to care about others and look after the interests of others uh, alongside our own interests and loving God and obeying God just so you can maximize self is probably not a good idea and a sign of a pretty immature Christian faith. Okay, instead we are taught um, by the Christian scriptures and by the theological tradition that uh, God should be loved because God um, made us and we, um, you know, we exist to glorify God and to honor God and uh, to, to use our lives as a, a way to enhance his glory and that should be our motivation, not just for the sake of self-interest. Okay, so the objection is that the wager is cynical and as Charles rightly mentioned, will uh, lead to a bunch of people behaving as if God existed so that they could maximize self-interest. Okay, and if this is, I agree, I, I'm convinced by that particular objection. If this is the only reason you believe in God, that's pretty thin. Okay, so while I think that this wager might be a good starting point, still I don't think it should be where you should finish up. Okay, and while it might be a good starting point to, you know, get people who um, otherwise wouldn't be interested in faith to think about the possibility of belief still, if that's where they end up, that's probably not a sign of, of growth, uh, personally speaking. Okay, so that's a good objection. All right, here's a second objection. The wager doesn't prove... The Christian God. You could run the wager for any faith system. Okay, you could run the wager. Suppose you um, believe in the Christian God, right? And you live your life as if the Christian God is uh, true and as if Christian moral teachings are correct and uh, you, you, you follow those moral teachings. And you die and you wake up on the other side and you realize, oh my goodness, it was Zeus the whole time. Oh, here I thought it was, you know, the Christian God and it was Zeus this entire time, right? Okay. Um, <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, right, so you can run the wager for, uh, for Islam, you can run the wager for Hinduism, you can run the wager for any system of faith. Okay, so the wager does not work as a proof for the existence of the Christian God. Okay, and that's the objection. And I think that that's a legitimate objection. I don't think the wager proves that we need to believe in the Christian God. I do think, however, that the wager proves that atheism is a very foolish worldview. Okay, I think that the wager proves that atheism is a foolish worldview. It is foolish for precisely the reasons that Pascal mentioned. You close off the possibility of you know, eternal bliss while opening yourself up to the possibility of deep sadness. The old adage is there aren't any atheists on their deathbeds, and while that might not be literally correct, still there are all sorts of people who have gone through their lives without faith who on their deathbeds decide, well, I'd better convert now uh, for the sake of you know, the unknown beyond. And while I think that that's kind of cynical for them to do that, still I guess it's better than nothing. And I think the wager does, basically what they're doing in that moment is they're, they're doing this wager, whether they realize it or not. I think the wager does prove that uh, atheism is a very foolish way to go through life. Okay, but it doesn't necessarily prove the truth of any one faith system like Christianity. Okay, questions or comments so far? There's a third objection. Objection number three. The wager... requires 
other proofs. It is a dependent argument for God's existence. It's a dependent argument for God's existence. Okay, um, if the probability of God's existence is zero, suppose the probability of God's existence is like nil. There is no probability that God could exist at all. Then the wager doesn't work. Okay, the probability of God's existence has to be greater than zero. The implicit um, kind of background here is that it's 50-50. Pascal, of course, would not think that it's 50-50 at all. He would think that the balance of evidence is much greater than that, that God exists. But suppose that the probability of God's existence is much less than 50%. Suppose the probability of God's existence is 1%. Okay, 1% on a decimal rendering is 0 0.01. If you multiply the probability of God's existence by the potential outcome values, then it quickly becomes clear what you should wager. So 0 0.01 times infinity equals what? Infinity, right? Okay, whereas 0 0.01 times minus 100 equals what? Negative one. <laughs> that's cool, that's cool. <laughs> All right, so pretty clearly, if the probability of God's existence is any value greater than zero, you should wager yes. Even if the probability of God's existence is only 1%, you should wager yes. Of course, Pascal thinks that the probability of God's existence is far greater than 1%. But if it is even just 1%, you should still wager yes. The wager, though, does not work if the probability of God's existence is zero. For that reason, the wager is dependent upon other proofs of God's existence. In other words, other proofs like what we've looked at in this class, the cosmological argument or the ontological argument or the teleological argument, they need to be used in order to establish some probability of God's existence that is greater than zero in order for the wager to be functional. Okay, so if as you inspect your minds, maybe using the teleological argument, let's say, you think to yourself, yeah, the probability of God's existence is probably greater than zero, you know, maybe even much greater than zero, then that's sufficient grounds, Pascal would say, for you to be able to choose yes on the wager, for you to be justified mathematically in choosing the uh, yes on the wager. Okay, so as long as that probability is made greater than zero by other arguments, then the wager works. But the wager fails to work, it ceases to function if the probability is indeed zero and not, at least to some extent, demonstrated by other arguments. Okay, so those are three objections. None of them actually refutes the wager. The wager has actually never been refuted as such. But all of them suggest that the wager maybe doesn't accomplish as much as we might initially think that it accomplishes when we first inspect it. Okay, it, it maybe creates bad character states in people sometimes. Uh, it doesn't prove the Christian God, although it maybe proves atheism to be uh, foolish. And it is a dependent argument, but not one that can stand on its own independently of any other arguments, because it requires other arguments to have proved that God's existence is at least a probability greater than zero. Okay, are there any questions or comments about this? reflections or observations. What do you guys think? Are we awake? Okay, can you speak up just a little bit, Tiffany? Because I'm having trouble hearing you through your mask. It's not fair to us for God to put us in, in this situation, but then I lost you. Right. Right, yeah, so Pascal thinks that we have been placed in a situation where we cannot opt out of the wager. That is correct. A good God would not put us in that sort of a situation? I think that's an interesting comment. I think that's a very good comment. Um, one frequent objection to the Christian God is uh, what might be called the divine hiddenness objection. 
Okay, so let me just put that up here. Divine hiddenness. Okay, and the objection goes like this. Why all the secrecy? Why all the hiddenness? Why doesn't God just reveal himself? And, you know, we would, like, we would be convinced and we would all obey and, and live happy, flourishing lives if he did that. Like, why all the secrecy? Why doesn't God just reveal himself? Yes, Charles. Right, yes. Yeah, you're absolutely right. That's, the, uh, that's the, um, the standard response that philosophers in the tradition have given, is that actually if God were to do that, that would be undermining our humanity. Because our free will, our ability to freely choose, would be completely compromised by that. We would have no choice but to believe in God. And so we'd be completely... I mean, like if God like reveals himself in all his glory or something like that, we'd just like be overwhelmed, you know, flattened immediately or something. Right? And, uh, and we wouldn't be able to actually be fully human. We'd, we'd be, like, completely compromised. Our free will would be completely compromised. For that reason, philosophers have argued, God chooses hiddenness. Okay, God chooses, you know, the cloak and dagger stuff, where you have to infer God's existence by looking at the complexity of creation, the complexity of the surrounding world, or, or the... Um, We'll look at another argument that Pascal was, uh, that Pascal advanced and was familiar with, the moral argument. You have to look at, um, at certain, you know, uh, certain features of the human existence and of the human condition in order to infer uh, God uh, and God's being the case and that sort of thing. Okay, so um, many have argued or objected that um, God has put us in an unfair situation by failing to reveal himself. God has, I mean, it's not fair to us for God to give us such little evidence. The objection has gone. Right? And the, the, the typical response that philosophers like Aquinas and Augustine and others have given is, actually God has given us an, an abundance of evidence. We just need to look for it and look at it. But he hasn't given us so much evidence that it completely overwhelms our free will so that we don't have a choice. Does that help a little bit, Tiffany? Do you have a response? Did I answer your question? Yeah, yeah, that's what you were, I thought you were talking about that. That's what I think that you were actually alluding to. Although you might not have like realized that it had a big sophisticated backstory yeah. to it and stuff. <laughs> okay. Cool, cool. All right, other reflections or comments on the Pascal Wager before we take a break? Let us take a break then. Two or three minutes. I mentioned a minute ago that the Pascal Wager is dependent upon other proofs for God's existence, and I'm going to share now uh, another proof that Pascal believed was important. Uh, to demonstrate God's existence, and that is the moral arguments. Okay, so the wager is dependent upon arguments like the moral arguments. What is the moral argument? Well, um, let's look at its premises. Premise number one, we'll call it A to distinguish it from our lecture points, um, morality exists. Okay. Uh, premise number two, God is the best or only explanation for morality. God is the best. We'll call that the weak 
version of the argument, or only, I call that the strong version of the argument, explanation of morality. Therefore, conclusion, God exists. Okay, um, let's talk about premise number one, morality exists. Few dispute this premise, some do, but most don't. Okay, certainly the great majority of human beings down through history have believed morality to exist. It's something that the great majority of human beings have uh, actually practiced. They've acted as though morality exists. Okay, sometimes you'll um, meet human beings who say that it's all so, they're, they're such hard-bitten relativists, they say, well, it's all just made up, it's a fiction, no real morality exists. Okay, if you meet such a person in life, here's my advice to you. Beat them over the head, steal their wallet, and run away and see if they protest. <laughs> okay? If they protest, that is a sign that they do not, practically speaking, believe what they have just told you, namely that morality is a fiction, because they have felt themselves to be violated in some way. And if they feel themselves to be violated, um, then they are acting as though some sort of objective moral uh, something, independent of their will or of your will or of our, of our individual will, uh, exists and is the case. Okay, so most people then have not disputed premise number one that morality exists. Okay, that's something that's just kind of taken for granted most of the time in inspections of this argument. Um, and again, to reiterate, the vast majority of human beings have lived their lives as though morality exists. Okay, so let's look at premise number two. God is the best or only explanation of morality. Let's start with the second only explanation of morality, the strong version of the argument. Okay, I don't find the strong version of the argument convincing. I don't think God is the only possible explanation of morality. I think there are other possible explanations of morality. Okay, so for instance, let's suppose we're all naturalists. A naturalist is someone who believes that uh, there is no other thing, no spiritual realm, nothing beyond nature. Okay, on naturalism, what might be the explanation of morality? Where does morality come from? From us, okay, from natural law, okay, um, all right, any others, yeah, conscience, okay, so if you don't believe that God exists, then you got to come up with some other explanation for this phenomenon that we call morality, where does it come from? Okay, and these are all, I think that these are all legitimate possible explanations. The dominant explanation, apart from theism, is called evolutionary naturalism. Okay, and let me explain how it works. On evolutionary naturalism, morality is something that has arisen because it helps to propagate the species. Okay, so... Um, if we all could just kill at will, that obviously wouldn't help propagate the species. Theft, lying, these all damage species propagation. The object of natural selection from the perspective of the species is to survive and to have offspring. And morality, so goes the evolutionary naturalist account, morality facilitates this. Morality facilitates survival and offspring. So having morality is better than not having morality on the evolutionary naturalist account because it promotes species propagation. And because of that, we have over time, over the millennia, been selected for those people who have a psychological sense of morality. In other words, the ones who didn't have a psychological sense of morality got picked off by natural selection. Those who were selected are the ones who have a mental faculty that feels morality to be true. This is what we were selected for. 
Okay, so that's the evolutionary naturalist explanation for morality. Um, now, immediately, there are some objections to this, so let me deal with the objections. I'm still talking about evolutionary naturalism. By the way, I'm, I'm raising evolutionary naturalism as a way of illustrating that I don't buy the strong version of this argument, you know, as Pascal or anybody else would render it, because I don't think that God is the only explanation, potential explanation for morality and for why morality is the case. Okay, um, what are the objections to evolutionary naturalism? Well, there are a bunch. If evolutionary naturalism is the case, then morality is relative. Okay, it's all just relative. Because morality isn't true, rather it is only something that is the case because it is useful for propagating the species. In other words, it is not true in a capital T truth sense that you should not take innocent human life. Rather, it is simply relatively the case so that, generally speaking, the species can continue. It is not true, though. And this is a frequent objection to evolutionary naturalism, is that the relativism that it suggests is actually deeply disturbing, because then that means that morality and moral principles are not actually you know, correct. They're just contingently the case. Matthew. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so on, um, on his view, having too many people is actually bad for the continuation of the species because you get things like, you know, famine and people uh, getting in each other's way. I don't know what all his, like, the movie doesn't actually go into no, depth that, about that. that. Like, that, 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 that basically, that, that becomes one problem with evolutionary naturalism. It's just like a kill because... Right, yeah, then it becomes okay to kill precisely because doing so could be of evolutionary advantage from the perspective of the species. Yeah, so that's a great point. And that's like really disturbing to a lot of people, that that's an implication of this view. Okay, um, evolutionary naturalism also, uh, you know, and what Matthew's question um, implies is that uh, morality can change from time to time in accordance with whatever will um, select for a species continuation or for certain uh, characteristic advantages that are um, that are, are, are successful for speciation. Okay, um, now also there's a second objection to evolutionary naturalism and it is that the people who advocate it don't behave as though it is the case. Okay, if you advocate evolutionary naturalism, then you must at some level believe morality just to be a fiction that we have been selected for because it helps promote the species' uh, continuation. But then the people who say that, that that is what morality is, so goes this objection, they don't actually believe as though that is, they don't actually behave as though that is the case. Okay, they behave as though morality is objective and not merely relative. Okay, and I've shared this in class before. You can pretty much always, when you encounter a moral relativist, press them hard enough and at some point they will break and they will say, no, 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 this particular moral principle is actually true. It is objective. Okay, and you know, if, if they think that the Aztec sacrifices were fine for Aztec culture, and they're relativists about the Aztec sacrifices, all you have to do is find some other issue that they're not relativists about because eventually everyone breaks and says, well, that's not relative, that's actually objectively true. Okay, and finally, like, like I said, <laughs> if they like are, are the really hard bitten type, then hit them over the head and steal their wallet and tell them it's relative. <laughs> okay. So the objection is that the evolutionary naturalists do not in practice behave as though evolutionary naturalism is the case. Ergo, hence, evolutionary naturalism is incoherent. Okay, um, the weak explanation 
view or the weak version of the argument I think is much more plausible and certainly Pascal found it to be the case. God is the best explanation of morality. So this is a probability-based argument like Pascal's other argument. Here it is a probability-based argument. It's not an argument that asserts that God is the only explanation for morality, at least on the weak version of it, but rather it is an argument that says that morality is best accounted for by saying that there is a divine figure who has created it. Okay, if you don't think a divine figure has created morality, like I mentioned, you have to find some other explanation for where it comes from. And the other explanations for where it comes from sometimes seem to lead to incoherence. Um, like the one that I illustrated, or I could press on a couple of other explanations if we wanted to talk about those and talk about uh, forms of incoherence that they also lead to. Okay, so this argument was convincing to Pascal. It's been convincing to some others as well. Um, there are some objections to it, but I haven't listed them yet. What do we think of this argument? What do we make of it? Is it convincing, not convincing? Do you find the fact that morality exists to be a reason for believing in the existence of God? What do you think? Let's hear some objections or some comments. Please, someone say something. You know, in professor school, they always say, just let the silence be. There are 30 of them and one of you, and one of them will crack first. <laughs> <laughs> Reflections on this argument. What do you guys think? Do you find it convincing? Do you find it not convincing? Blida, is this a convincing argument? You don't know. Okay. Esther, is this a convincing argument? <laughs> oh my goodness, I thought people would be more engaged with this one. Okay. All right, well, let me, let me then talk about some objections, okay? Um, so I personally find this argument to be convincing. I think that the existence of morality is actually a reason for believing in God's existence, okay? But um, there are objections, and those objections primarily come from um, the kinds of considerations that I just mentioned when I described evolutionary naturalism. Okay, we can come up with other explanations for this phenomenon of morality, um, so, apart from evolutionary naturalism, we could argue that uh, morality is just a fiction that we all have decided upon. Not that evolution is selected for us, but it is a group fiction that we've all decided upon. Okay, so this is an alternative explanation of a potential objection to the argument, and that is that the source of morality or the explanation for morality is that it is a group fiction. Okay, um, if it is a group fiction, okay, let, actually let me describe the group fiction view for just a minute more before I uh, poke at it. Uh, the group fiction view holds then that uh, there's no truth in morality. It's a fiction that we have come up with so that we can better live together and keep everybody under control. Because quite obviously, if uh, morality, if it got out that morality was just a fiction, then we'd have a whole bunch of people acting out and doing other things than uh, behaving as they should, and this would cause all sorts of social problems. So the fiction continues and is propagated institutionally and um, supported by authorities and so forth. Okay, um, let me poke at the um, group fiction view. If it is a group fiction, if that is indeed the case, and that's the, the explanation for morality, I don't see any reason why I or anybody else should be moral. Like, seriously, if it's just a group fiction, why conform to the group? Like, what, what advantage is there in conforming to the group, especially if you can, as a lot of people do go through life doing, 
if you can present the appearance of being moral while not in fact being moral. So if you can appear to be conforming to the group fiction while actually not, and telling lies or cheating or doing whatever you want to do, if you can appear to be conforming while actually not conforming, then you can almost certainly get away, uh, almost certainly get through life better and be more successful than you would otherwise be if you did conform, because the group fiction is limiting to us. Okay, so if it is just a group fiction, I think there's a serious motivation problem. If it is just a group fiction, I don't see how you can convince people to abide by it. Okay, yourself, myself, or any of us to abide by it. So I think the group fiction explanation for morality succumbs to the motivation objection. It strikes me as being, in fact, deeply debilitating to the group fiction view. Why be moral? Well, the group fiction view really has no good explanation for the why be moral question. Okay, um, shoot, I'm out of time. Okay, questions or comments about the group fiction objection? I've put three views of morality and its source up here on the board. The view that uh, it has a theistic source, the view that it has an evolutionary naturalistic source, or the view that it is a group fiction that we've come up with. Uh, are there any reflections on any of these three sources? Group fiction means everyone agrees, more or less, to abide by the same principles and to support institutions that uphold those principles, but in fact, uh, those principles are all false. They're not actually like capital T true. They're just a fiction that we've come up with. Yeah, man. I'll tell you what. Uh, society seems to be coming apart at the seams so frequently today. Like, people are just going off and doing random stuff now. And I wonder if it's because they don't believe, a lot of them don't believe in God or don't believe that, you know, there's some sort of a, a cosmic moral uh, system that it's just like them. And uh, it's scary. It's really scary when a, a large population 